What's going on, smart people? You read the title. Today we are solving the ubiquitous block on the plane problem, but to be honest with you, I'm so sick and tired of these motherfucking blocks on these motherfucking planes. Just kidding, I think they're actually kind of fun. But today, we are going to be solving the problem where we have some inclined plane. I'm going to specify some values. Uh, we're going to have a little block on here. It's going to have some mass. We're going to be pushing on this block with some applied force. And then there's also going to be some friction in between the block and the plane, and this is elevated by some angle theta. Now let's get some uh, let's get some numerical values for us. But to, before we begin, I want to specify that what we're actually solving here is the acceleration of the block. After we take into account the fact that it's elevated, the fact that we got a force acting on it, and then we got um, we've got some friction, is the block going to accelerate downwards or is it going to go upwards? That's what we're going to find out today. Now I'm going to write some values up here for, for these forces, these angles, stuff like that, but don't get excited, okay? We're not plugging values in right away. We're going to keep stuff in variable form as long as possible. But uh, we're going to let the mass go ahead and equal 5 kilograms. We're going to let uh, we're going to let mu equal 0 0.5. This is the coefficient of static friction. Uh, we're going to let this applied force equal 10 newtons at uh, we're just going to have it be 0 degrees. Okay, so it's just purely in the horizontal direction here, as we have defined here. What else do we need? We need a um, is that it? And let's let theta equal 45 degrees. Perfect. Okay, so whenever it comes to solving these kinds of problems, what I like to do first is I like to establish what, what forces are acting on this. Okay, and when we look at this, we see we have an applied force here, some external force here. We're going to have a force of friction. Let's go ahead and write this stuff down. So we're going to have, here's our forces. We're going to have a uh, gravity. Okay. And normal force. Whew, okay, so we got gravity, we're gonna have a normal force, we're gonna have some friction. We're gonna have also this pushing force. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, and this one. Great. Now, what I like to do right now, we can impose if we wanted to some xy coordinate system, x going in this direction, y going in this direction, but that's messy. So, what we're going to be considering instead is the force in the parallel direction and force in the perpendicular direction. And what I mean by that is parallel to the direction that the block is going to be sliding and perpendicular to where this block will be sliding. So, mathematically, you can think of this as taking our xy coordinate system and rotating it to some x prime, y prime. So, there's actually an equation for, uh, for changing coordinate systems for uh, coordinate transformations that are under rotation. Um, but we're not going to get into that here. Just know that we're actually going to be considering this as our coordinate system. Now, instead of calling it x prime, y prime, I'm just going to leave it as we're going to be interested in parallel and perpendicular. Okay, so that's parallel, that's perpendicular. And what I want to do first is I want to establish what all of these component forces are in this parallel and in this perpendicular direction. So the first one, let's talk about gravity. So I'm going to have a comma with a G to specify that we're talking about gravity in the parallel direction and gravity in the perpendicular direction. Now, if we draw sort of our free body diagram, we know that gravity is pulling straight down, but this can also be broken down into components, right? We're going to have some stuff moving in this direction and then in this direction if we were to break down this, uh, this component of gravity. So that tells us right off the bat, you know that we're going to have to do some sines and cosines in here. We know the magnitude of gravity is going to be mg, right? That's the units of gravity. And we know that there's going to be a sine and a cosine somewhere. And this is where you could go through all the trig that your heart could ever desire, if you'd like to, to find out what these are. Or you can take a look at the limiting cases. So think about this. If we have theta, yes, I, I said that it's 45 degrees, but let's pretend I didn't say that. Let's pretend that theta is zero degrees. So the plane, the inclined plane, is actually just a flat surface. In that case, which of these things survive? Is, is the force of gravity going to be acting in the perpendicular direction to the plane? So just for perspective, here's our new plane where there is no elevation. 
is gravity going to be acting like this or like this? If you said this, get off my video. So I think it goes without saying that gravity is going to be going straight down. So the thing that survives in the limiting case that theta is actually zero degrees, we know that this is the term that survives, meaning F perp G is equal to the magnitude F of G at theta equal to zero, okay? So that means that this term must get the cosine of theta, because if theta is zero, then we just get mg. And if that tells us that this must be the sine, because if sine of theta, so theta is zero, this term goes to zero. Similarly, you could do the same thing to where if we rotate it by 90 degrees, so that we have something straight up, then gravity is going to be moving parallel to the block, right? It's going to be going that way meaning this survives, this term survives at 90 degrees. So that's, that's a little bit of a logic check, and that saved us from doing some trigonometry. Okay, now in this convention, since I have this term looking positive, what I'm really saying is that I'm assuming gravity to be negative. So gravity is minus 9.8 meters per second squared, because I'm saying that this is the thing that's pushing down on us. Okay, so this is our gravity. Let's, let's make a little label here. So this is gravity. That is not a G. That's not what G's look like. Gravity. Okay. And then let's also take into account the next one. Uh, we're going to save normal force for last, and I'll tell you why once we get to it. So let's talk about the, the pushing force now. This is the thing that's trying to push it up the block. Or push it up the ramp, rather. Push. Okay, so let's establish F parallel push, and F parallel, or I mean perpendicular, sorry, push. Okay, and we're going to do the exact same thing, where we're going to logic check ourselves here. So if we take the limit that theta goes to zero, so this goes down, well then, this is facing the same direction that the push is going, so all of the push is going to be in that parallel direction. So if theta goes zero, then it's facing the same direction as the push, that's the thing that survives, which tells us that in the push case, this is what gets the cosine theta. So let's just write this as the magnitude of the force, of the push force, times the cosine of theta, and by default, this gives us the sine of theta. Okay, and then semi-lastly, we have the friction force. Okay. F, I'm going to write that as F little f parallel and F little f perpendicular. All right. Now, the friction is going to be that way or that way in the direction of parallel, right? It wouldn't make sense for it to be uh, going perpendicular to the surface. So this perpendicular one by default gets zero, okay? And the friction force... Um, think about having like a tablecloth or a table sheet that you put on top of a table and then you rip it off right away. It's going to be pretty easy to do, but if you put some weight perpendicular to where the tablecloth is on the table, it's going to be harder to move. That tells you that the friction force is proportional to the force that is normal to the surface. Okay, so when I say proportional to, that means equal to times some constant. That constant we call the coefficient of friction. So the friction force here is going to be the normal force times our coefficient of friction. Now, I haven't specified whether this is a positive force, meaning moving in this direction or moving in the negative direction. And in order to do that, all we have to do is solve the case where there is no friction. So if we solve the case where there is no friction, where we just have someone pushing up and gravity pushing down, um, let's go ahead and solve that real quick. So in this case, we have... Uh, m g sine theta plus f cosine theta, I'm going to drop the magnitude because it's positive anyways, um, is equal to mass times acceleration in the parallel direction. We divide both sides by the mass, we get g sine theta plus f over m cosine theta equals the acceleration g is pretty much negative 10, right? It's, it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is approximately minus 10 times
times uh, root 2 over 2 plus, so we've got f over m, which is 10 over 5, so that is just going to be 2 root 2 over 2 equals the acceleration. So by looking at this, we can see that the negative, uh, the negative term dominates, meaning the acceleration is going to be negative. So if we neglect any kind of friction, this thing is falling down and friction opposes the motion that it would otherwise be traveling in and since we're calling this positive here or sorry well since g is negative g is negative which makes this whole thing negative and uh, what that tells us is that the friction is going to be working in the opposite direction saying this is positive okay so that's a long-winded way of saying that's why this term here we're not calling negative mu n for more intuition as to why, uh, so let's logic check to make sure that this makes sense. What this is saying is that if we have a block resting on here, block resting on the surface, we require zero friction in order for it to stay there. Likewise, if we have something that is parallel, uh, if so if we rotate this by like 90 degrees or so, we need exactly infinite amount of friction in order for it to stay like this. Great. Okay, now we're ready to talk about the normal force. So the normal force is the thing that is opposing this thing, this block, going through, you know, going through the floor. So since we have our little block here, we have our force of gravity. So let's say this is our normal force. And then we've got our pushing force. And we've got our, uh, what else do we got? Force of gravity. Okay. Um, the normal force is going to be the difference between these two forces here. We've got something pulling us down and something pushing us up. Uh, if we took gravity to be positive and also left this positive, then it would be the sum of these two things. But since this is negative and this is positive, it's going to be the difference between the two forces. So what I'm saying is that the normal force, since it's the difference between these two, we can write as n is equal to f sine theta minus, uh, we're going to have mg cosine theta. All right. And uh, so now we're ready to basically solve for the acceleration explicitly in terms of this parallel term here. And we can do that because it's not like it's accelerating downwards, right? It can either go this way or this way, but it's not going to go below the floor, which tells you, you know, that the perpendicular one is going to be zero. Okay, so we have, um, so we have F parallel is equal to uh, mg sine theta plus F cosine theta plus mu times n, which is this. So we got f sine theta minus ng cosine theta. Okay, and this is equal to mass times acceleration in the parallel direction. We could do this again for the perpendicular direction, but it really is just the sum of these forces plus the normal force. Uh, and that would be equal to zero because it's not going to be accelerating this way. Okay? And now we can just solve for this acceleration. So that says that acceleration, if we divide both sides by m in the parallel direction, is equal to g sine theta plus f over m cosine theta plus mu uh, f over m sine theta minus g cosine theta. Let's go ahead and plug in our values. I'm going to say g is approximately just minus 10. You can go ahead and use 9.8 if you'd like. This will this will be fine for us. Uh, so this is going to be minus 10 
root 2 over 2, because sine of 45 degrees is root 2 over 2, g is minus 10, plus 2 root 2 over 2, cosine is the same, plus 1 half times f over m, which is going to be 2 root 2 over 2, minus uh, minus minus 10, so minus minus 10 root 2 over 2. These minuses are going to cancel, so that's going to give us a plus. Okay. Uh, it looks like I'm running out of space down there, so I'm going to continue this up here. Minus 10 root 2 over 2 plus 2 root 2 over 2 is going to be minus 8 root 2 over 2 plus 1 half. 2 root 2 over 2 plus 10 root 2 over 2 is going to be 12 root 2 over 2, which is equal to minus 8 root 2 over 2. I hate numbers. That's 6 root 2. That's 6 root 2 over 2. That's uh, plus. Okay, and then that gives us a final answer. So that's going to be minus 2 root 2 over 2, giving us that acceleration in the parallel direction is equal to minus root 2 meters per second squared. Maybe we could write approximate because we approximated g. And just like that, we found the acceleration of this block. It's going down. I'm yelling timber. So it's kind of a long way of doing it, but I promise going through the trigonometry of also just rigorously finding out what these angles are or what these trig functions would be attached to these components would be much longer. In case I didn't explain it too well, how to interpret this is that the acceleration is root 2 meters per second squared. The negative sign says that it's going down the ramp. So you might see some solutions to things like this saying root 2 meters per second squared down the ramp. That's what I'm using this negative sign for. And frankly, I think that this is more of a correct way of looking at it because I've seen other people use it to where they keep the positive sign notation for things like gravity but then also keep gravity positive and then they somehow arrive at the conclusion that it's down the ramp so I think this kind of throws it in your face a little bit more I hope you guys found this video helpful and a little bit useful uh, I think these kinds of problems are really good for, for if you're just starting out with physics and this incorporated a lot of things into it so I don't really see ramp problems getting much more involved than this one is so again, I hope you guys found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.